Hi, welcome to my channel, Quantum Computing with Anna. Did you ever wonder how entanglement can be used as a resource? Do you want to see how it can be used to win games and how it relates to Bell's inequality? In this video, I will explain that with a physical system, the behavior Einstein expected, the different behavior implied by quantum mechanics, and the classical and quantum strategies used by players of the CHSH game. So here's a physical theory which denies quantum mechanics, but that nevertheless tries to reproduce the results of experiments that have actually been performed. This theory gives an upper bound on the correlations of spin measurements, as I will demonstrate. The physical system could be, for example, two electrons, two other spin one-half particles, or two photons. The particles could have been created by pair production or spontaneous parametric down conversion of photons. In the case of spin one-half particles, such as electrons, a magnetic field would be used to measure the component of spin in the direction of the field. The measurement outcome for identically prepared systems will sometimes be plus one and sometimes minus one, and there is a correlation between the outcomes for the two particles that, de that depends on the angle between the two magnetic fields. The measurement outcomes that will later occur are imprinted on the particles. That imprint is represented by the hidden variable lambda as described in John Bell's seminal paper. It's as if the phrases, I am spin up, or I am spin down, were painted on the sides of the particles in an invisible color, which cannot be sensed by the human eye or detected by any existing physical instruments. In the words of John Bell, it is a matter of indifference whether lambda denotes a single variable or a set or even a set of function and whether the variables are discrete or continuous. In this derivation I am about to give, lambda is assumed to be a continuous variable, a real number like 0, 1.5, or pi, ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity. However, even without this assumption, the result would be the same as Bell argues in his paper. Rather than examine the detailed distribution of the measurement outcomes, we're going to look at averages, specifically the average of the product of the measurement outcomes for the two particles, that is, the expectation value. These outcomes are represented by A and B. A and B, two functions which depend only on the direction of the magnetic fields and on the hidden variable lambda. Rho of lambda represents the probability that at the time the particles were created they were imprinted with the value lambda. E represents the expectation value and since we are averaging over a very large number of identical systems the expectation value depends only on the magnetic fields. It does not depend on lambda. We are averaging over lambda. A and B, capital A and capital B, represent the measurement outcomes for the two particles, and they satisfy these inequalities. Basically, they're both less than one in magnitude. The laws of probability dictate this formula for the expectation value as an integral, a weighted sum, if you like, of the product of A and B, weighted by the probability distribution of the hidden variable lambda. Consider the situation in which there are pairs of systems with the magnetic fields in the first of the two systems given by A and B and the fields in the second of the two systems given by A prime and B prime. The next steps in the derivation are given in the linked Wikipedia article. 
go to the description of the video and download the script and you will have access to the links. The Wikipedia article is entitled The CHSH Inequality. So here's a formula for the difference in the two expectation values. It looks kind of complicated, but it's actually not too bad if you pick it apart. Here is the triangle inequality for absolute values. It says that the absolute value of a sum is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values. Using this and doing more algebra gives this inequality for the difference between the two expectation values. And this implies that the if we define a variable s as given here, that the magnitude of s is less than or equal to 2. Now experiments have been done which give a value of s greater than 2. This discredits the hidden variable theory. And it's one reason why quantum mechanics is accepted today as valid, even though perhaps none of us really understand it completely. The, CS, the CHSH game, the topic of this video, provides an example of the violation of this inequality. Analyzing the same physical system, but assuming the laws of quantum mechanics rather than hidden variables gives a higher bound on the expectation value. If M represents the expectation value for a measurement, then we can follow the second linked Wikipedia article with a different notation. In the table I'm showing here, I give the correspondence between the notation used for the classical case, the CSHS, in CHSH inequality and the quantum inequality. So we define an operator, a measurement B, which is exactly whose expectation value is exactly the same as the average that we calculated for the CHSH inequality. A and B are the measurements. Since they're equal to plus or minus 1, their square is always 1, which is the identity matrix. So B squared is given by this formula right here. And the expectation value of the commutator satisfies this inequality right here, less than or equal to 2. This says that the expectation value is less than or equal to 2 times the square root of 2. So this is a higher bound for the expectation value. It's a little more than 2.8 versus 2. This is the reason why the players of the CHSH game, when they have entangled quantum computers, they can win more often than when they're playing without these resources. Their strategy achieves an expectation value exactly at the upper limit. And their win probability satisfies 2p minus 1 equals 1 over the square root of 2, which I will now demonstrate. So finally, we're going to describe the game. In this game, Alice and Bob need to cooperate to win as many rounds as possible. They are not allowed to communicate after the game has started, so they must agree on a strategy before the first round. The referee gives Alice a 0 or a 1, and she responds with a 0 or a 1. Likewise, the referee gives Bob a 0 or a 1, and he must respond with a 0 or a 1. To win a round, Alice's and Bob's responses must be identical to one another unless the referee gives them both ones. In that case, Alice's and Bob's responses must be different from one another. One way of summarizing these rules is to say that the exclusive OR of the two players' responses must be equal to the product of the referee's choices. <coughs> So 
So in this table, I show the winning responses. Without quantum, the way Alice and Bob agree on a strategy is for each player to define a function that takes one bit in, the referee's choice for that player, and gives one bit out, the player's response. There are only four such functions, only four functions that map one bit to one bit. The zero function, the one function, the not function, and the identity function, which does nothing. So a st shared strategy for the two players consists of Alice's function, call it capital A, and Bob's function, B. We need to decide what strategy results in the greatest number of wins, assuming that the referee's choices of 1 and 0 are equally probable. If both Alice and Bob choose the 0 function, always responding with 0, they will win 75% of the time. I will show that there is no better strategy. Assume that Alice's function A, acting on 0, gives 1, that is A of 0 equals 1, and Bob's function B of 0 equals 1, but not both. Then they lose when the referee gives them both zeros. If both A of 0 and B of 0 are equal to 1, then they lose when the referee gives them a 0 and a 1. So we can assume that both A of 0 and B of 0 are equal to 0. If A of 1 is also equal to 0, then B of 1 has to be different. It has to be 1, since otherwise they would lose when the referee gives them both 1s. Likewise, if B of 1 is 0, then A of 1 has to be 1. Because the rules for Alice and Bob are the same, we need to only consider one of these two cases. We'll take the first one. We have the following values. And they lose again when the referee gives them both 1s. So the best strategy has a win probability no greater than 75%. The quantum strategy is based on the physical system we used for the CHSH inequality and Tirelson's bound. Two particles whose spins can be measured in two ways. That is, for each particle, there are two different magnetic fields that can be applied. Or you can look at it more abstractly and just say that Alice and Bob each have a one-bit quantum computer and that the two computers are prepared in an entangled state. Each qubit is measured in one of two ways. That is, with respect to one of two bases. Before the round starts, Alice and Bob agree on the following strategy. Each of them will use the referee's choice to select a basis, and they will ask their computer to perform a measurement in that basis. Alice's two bases are each different from Bob's bases. If the measurement outcome is the same, then the player responds with zero. I'm sorry, if the measurement outcome is minus one, then the player responds with zero, and if the measurement outcome is plus one, then they respond with one. So when the referee gives either of them a zero, they have to both get ones or both get minus one. In either case, the product is one for them to win and minus one for them to lose. So the expectation value E and the win probability P satisfy the following relationship. E is equal to 2 times P minus 1, and P is equal to 1 half E plus 1.
To maximize the wind probability, Alice and Bob's magnetic fields need to be at 135 degree angles from one another because E equals minus cos and theta, where theta is the angle between the magnetic fields. This is a fact I will now prove following John Preskill's video, and there is a hyperlink in the script pointing to that video. The quantum state that is shared by Alice and Bob's computers is called a singlet, singlet state for historical reasons having to do with the physical picture I have given, a single entangled state with two spin one-half particles in a magnetic field. Unlike the other three Bell states, the light emitted and absorbed by this pair would not be split into multiple wavelengths. The spectrum would be all one wavelength. That's why it's called a singlet state. Physically, the combined spin of the two particles adds up to zero. Here is the state. U is spin up, that is measurement plus one, and D is spin down, measurement minus one. This state has an interesting and useful property namely that it is invariant under rotation. This goes along with the fact that its light spectrum would not be split by a magnetic field. It has no preferred direction. The fact that the total spin is zero is expressed mathematically as, as shown in this formula right here. I is the identity operator, that is it doesn't change the state it acts on. Sigma i is sigma x, sigma y, or sigma z, poly spin matrices, and the x with a circle around it is the tensor product. The three poly matrices correspond to the three directions in the three-dimensional space we live in, and they basically rotate the qubit about the corresponding axis. To verify this relationship, you would apply the operators on the left side of the tensor product symbol to the first qubit, and the operators on the right side of the symbol to the second qubit. The terms you get cancel in pairs. If you try it with one of the other Bell states, the terms don't cancel because these states are triplet states. They have preferred directions. They are not rotationally invariant. From this starting point, Preskill demonstrates the following this expectation value, where TR is a trace, the sigma with the vector arrow above it is a vector of, of the three poly matrices. A and B are unit vectors in the directions of the magnetic fields, and rho sub A is the reduced density operator representing the state of Alice's particle after Bob's particle has been measured. Now it is a property of a Bell state, any Bell state, because of entanglement that all information about Alice's particle is lost to Bob, indicated by the fact that rho sub A is equal to one half times the identity. So what we've done is go from an expression involving both particles to one involving only Alice's particle. This is necessary because Alice cannot see what Bob is doing. That would be against the rules. Using the fact that the trace is linear and that the product of two sigma matrices is only non-zero, when the matrices are identical, yields the formula for E minus cos and theta, as promised, giving a wind probability of 1 plus E over 2, which is about 85.85 or 85%. So this is better than they would have done without the quantum computers. This is why entanglement is referred to as a resource, because people can use it to accomplish things that they would not be able to do without their quantum computers. 
All that remains is to show the directions of the magnetic fields. Now they all lie in a plane, so they can be depicted on a piece of paper or a computer monitor, and here they are. I've provided a key showing the, me the measurement axis depending on the referee's input and the measurement outcome. So A0 is opposite A1, B0 is opposite B1, and so on. Theta is always 135 degrees. In closing, I would like to express my deep gratitude to my production partner, Bruce Lang, and to my patrons, whose generous support make, made this video possible. My patrons are Barry Bird, Amon Darcy, Laura Hees, Richard Johnston, Sammy Konkar, Michael Kanovich, Jesse Parker, Heru Sechibuki, and William Slater. Thank you very much. And to you, my viewer, I bid you good night. I hope to see you in person or online.